know that you had a rough day today, but then you had one day and a half to rest. And uh, now we are very happy to have with us Mr. Ephraim Alevi. Ephraim Alevi uh, served in many positions in Israel. Uh, he was ambassador to the European Union, and he was also had the responsibility of being the head of the Mossad. And he is going, he's also a, f a friend of the Institute of the University, and he's going to tell us how to charter our ways in the rough seas in the desert. Yes. Um, good evening. Uh, I don't usually like to use microphones uh, for professional reasons. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I realize that uh, in your company I have to uh, abide by the rules and regulations. Uh, I don't have any formulas to uh, write on the board. In the business I was involved in, we had no formulas. Uh, but uh, I hope, uh, in some respects, uh, I could be of use to you this evening. And uh, it's an honor, a great honor for me to uh, be invited to speak to you, uh, Professor Rabinovich, Eliezer, as I call him, uh, if I may, is um, an old friend of mine. Uh, not in so many eras, but all in many activities which we did together, not in the intelligence field. And um, um, I realize that this is a very, very uh, uh, auspicious and a very, very uh, um, special uh, uh, gathering of, uh, of minds and of uh, capabilities. And I feel honored to be here and uh, to some extent a little awed by the uh, presence uh, of you listening to me. Um, just something uh, in terms of history. Uh, I began in the Mossad in 1961, but in actual fact, uh, without knowing it, I began some activities before. And the year 1956, which is, I think, uh, a year in which most of you were not yet born. Maybe all of you were not yet born. Uh, not all of you. <laughs> Most of you, most of you were not born, most of you, most of you were not born. Um, I was president of the uh, Israeli uh, Union of Students, uh, National Union of Israeli Students, and uh, I was uh, the representative of the student uh, body uh, on the international scene, which was then a scene in 1956, uh, the, one of the heights of the Cold War. And I traveled to Moscow in 1956 and represented uh, the uh, Union at a meeting in Moscow and then went on to Prague and uh, represented it in Prague in the International Union of Students, which was a, a Union of Students under the uh, control and under the uh, auspices of the uh, uh, International Communist Party, especially the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And then I went on uh, and traveled on to uh, an island which was once called Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka, where there was a, another international organization of the western part of the uh, world of the International Student Union. I was there as well. And uh, so um, I go back a long way. I would like to speak this evening about a few uh, of the basics of the way Israel has viewed its uh, policies over the years and how it's conducted its affairs. And I will also, in the end, speak about two or three uh, current of, of matters, maybe say something about Iran, because if I don't say something about Iran, there are Israelis here who will report me to the authorities and say that I didn't say the right thing about Iran. I didn't even mention Iran, and I cannot <coughs> afford that. And I'll also say something about the, um, um, the terrorist uh, threat and what it uh, entails today. I'm sure many of you have uh, often visited London, London, UK. Um, next time you're there, if you're there in the next few months, I um, uh, advise you to go to uh, Grosvenor Square, where there is the American Embassy, but not because of the American Embassy. Right next to the Embassy, on the northern side of the Embassy, there's a small little street called Upper Book Street. And if you uh, go along Upper Brook Street, um, 
The numbers there are consecutive. They're not odd and uh, even numbers on either side of the road, but very often in Britain, all the numbers are consecutive either side. If you go to number 33, you'll find something very different in number 33 from all the houses in that street. It's still there. I'm not, I don't think it will last very long, and I'll tell you why. And you'll find that there are iron railings uh, in front of all these houses. And they're all identical except for the house of number 33, where the spikes are spikes of gold. Which denotes, of course, that there was something very special in that building. If you were allowed to uh, enter the building, which you would not be allowed, uh, which I did enter, you will suddenly find yourself in the middle of a Middle Eastern palace, which was constructed as a copy of the palace of the inhabitant of that house, which he visits once, he used to visit once every ten years, he used to use this palace of his once every ten years, and he wanted that to be in a position which every place he came he had his palace so he could feel comfortable. At present, unfortunately, he's very sick. He has colon cancer. He's uh, in a German uh, medical facility. And uh, apparently uh, his chances of uh, recovery are very slim. I first met him in 1975 um, when I visited him in one of his... Uh, cities, towns, uh, away from the capital, down south of his country, where he was waging a war, a war against the neighboring country. And the war was a war uh, between uh, his country, which was the uh, uh, Sultanate of Oman, and the uh, uh, Southern Republic of South Yemen, which was a republic then which was allied to the Soviet Union and to the Communist Front, the Communist cause. And uh, the Omanis were not doing very well. Uh, actually, they were doing very badly. And uh, I came along and uh, met with the uh, ruler of Oman, uh, Sultan Qaboos uh, bin Sultan is his name. And he uh, described the situation which he was in, and I subsequently brought another person or two with me on a, another visit. And we were able, to some extent, to contribute to a change of the, uh, the way the battle was going. And Oman survived. Oman is a very important sultanate. It's on the uh, shores of the uh, uh, Arabian Sea, the... Uh, um, Iranian uh, Sea, the Gulf, the Persian Gulf, it has three names. It's at the tip, at the southern tip of the Gulf. And it, contra it controls on one side the Straits of Musandam, which are the Straits through which much of the oil which uh, 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 is responsible for the, getting the wheels to go round in the west and the east and north and the south of the world, where the oil comes from. It's a very strategic spot. And I visited the, the Straits. And we maintained a relationship with Oman for a very long time. Not, I was not the only person involved in it. And uh, when in 1994, which was about 20 years later, we were able to sign a peace treaty between Israel and Jordan, in which I was involved, I was the personal envoy of the then Prime Minister, Yitzhak Rabin, who uh, was a very, very important figure in this country. For many, many years he was Chief of Staff in the War of the Six-Day War, and I will not go into it further. But he was also the Israeli ambassador in Washington after the Six-Day War, and I was the Mossad station chief there for four years and served with him, under him. So we had a very special personal relationship as well. When Yitzhak Rabin ultimately signed the peace treaty between Israel and Jordan, 
He called me and he said, I don't want this peace treaty to be just a bilateral event. I want this to be a regional event. I want the peoples of the region to understand that something basically has changed and now we can do things we never did before in our relations with the region as a whole. I want you to arrange for me to visit the Sultan of, Iran, of Oman in Oman. And I want this to be a public event. So I traveled to Oman and uh, I didn't uh, succeed in making it a, an entirely a public event, but what I did succeed in was getting his approval that after the meeting had taken place, after the aircraft took off from Oman back home to Israel to Lod Airport, it would become uh, public knowledge, and it did. And Prime Minister Rabin flew directly from Israel to Oman in an Israeli aircraft. By the way, a civilian aircraft. He didn't want to travel in a military aircraft. And he had a very, very important meeting with the Sultan, the only meeting he ever had. A year later, he was assassinated. The idea that Israel is not just an island in the Middle East was very important for Israel from the very beginning. It was important for Israel from two aspects. One was that the countries surrounding us, immediately surrounding us, after the War of Independence, did not make peace with Israel. On the contrary, they continued to be belligerent. We did not sign any peace treaty with other country around us. We had what we call uh, armistice treaties, armistice agreements. An armistice is an armistice. It's not a peace agreement. We had no relations, no official relations with the countries around us. And in these circumstances, we decided, and the Prime Minister of Israel, the first Prime Minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, decided that we would have a policy called the periphery policy. We would reach out beyond our uh, enemies, and we would create a network of relationships with the countries beyond us. And in the 50s and the 60s, we branched out and we created relations, very, uh, very fruitful relations with Turkey. We established a, a diplomatic uh, presence in Turkey with Iran, with the Shah of Iran at the time, south with uh, Ethiopia, and we began feeling towards the, our immediate neighbors. And as of the 60s, we had two other secret relationships. One was with King Hussein of Jordan, and the other was with King Hassan II of Morocco. These were very meaningful relationships. They were relationships with not just two leaders getting together and talking about uh, the weather and the affairs of state. These were very deep and very uh, significant relationships. Relationships which not only brought us together with Jordan and with uh, Morocco, but also in the future relationships which created strategic interests between us, between us and them. Strategic in as much that in 1977, 15 year, years after King Hassan had first met ahead of the Mossad, he met him in 1962, 1977, it was possible to have a secret meeting between the then Israel Foreign Minister, Moshe Dayan, and the Deputy Prime Minister of Egypt, which began the process which ended in the peace treaty between Israel and Egypt, which was the first peace treaty between Israel and an Arab state. So these relationships served also bo both to have a, a, a strategic backdrop and also to be a, um, a catalyst to create the circumstances for us to be able to get into the region. We were then a very lonely country. Our relationships in the world were very, very few and far between strategically. We had no strategic relation with the United States, by the way. During the War of Independence, the United States had an arms embargo slapped on Israel. People in the United States, Jews who wanted to help their fellow Jews in Israel, were caught, brought to trial and sentenced and sent to jail for uh, trying to uh, um, ship armaments to Israel, to smuggle armaments into Israel. It took 20 years for us to have a relationship, a strategic relationship with the, uh, with the United States of America. 
We had a, a diplomatic relations. We had diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union. We had a very intricate diplomatic relation, a very um, difficult diplomatic relationship because at that time there was a big Jewish community in Eastern Europe and especially in the Soviet Union. And because of that we needed to be very careful the way I, we handled our relationships around the world because we didn't want to um, disturb the Jews in Russia. But we reached out to the Jews in Russia. We tried to create Tronkats with the Jews in Russia. It was very difficult. At that time there was what was called the Iron Curtain, if you remember the Iron Curtain. The reason I was there in Moscow in 1956 was to arrange for a, the read, a, a youth festival which is going to take place next year in 1957, which was the first time after Israel came into being that we were able to reach out in a public manner to the Jews in the Soviet Union. So we had many interests and many aspects that which we had to take care of. And we were a small country. When we uh, declared independence, we were 600,000. We were 600,000 and within a year or two, we had more than a million immigrants who came into Israel. We had economic difficulties. We didn't have the wherewithal sometimes to pay for the oil tankers who brought oil to Israel and who uh, dropped anchor outside Haifa, uh, Haifa port waiting to be paid for the oil in order to, be, to come in and to disgorge their, uh, their oil. We had food rationing in Israel in the 50s. We didn't have uh, sufficient food to go around. We had rationing for, for, for kitchen utensils as well. I'm describing this to you not in order that you should have retrospective uh, pity for us. We were not pitiful. We were very joyful at the time. But we had our uh, problems. We had our restrictions. We had our restraints, constraints, restraints. And we had to conduct our affairs in a very, very circumspect manner. But we also had to create a situation in which we would be a player. Because we understood that in order for Israel to survive in this region, which is not only the way it is today, but it has been always this way, that way or another, for a variety of reasons, we had to be not only powerful in ourselves, but we had to, we had to project a real and a credible capability to fend for ourselves. We had to be in a situation which in any circumstance, ultimately we could have the upper hand. And we had to be a valuable player on the regional scene and ultimately on the international scene. Because the international powers of the world at the time, uh, Russia on the one hand, the Soviet Union and the United States, when one way or another saw the Middle East as an area which had strategic importance for them. Oil for the West and Russia because uh, geographically uh, the Middle East is very close to Russia. And also because Russia has and the Soviet Union had uh, uh, large segments of the population who were Muslim and are Muslim to this very day. And they draw their inspiration in one way or another, sometimes also from the uh, centers of uh, Islam which are in Saudi Arabia. The relationships were relationships which had undercurrents. Uh, a colleague of mine, um, who was a very, very senior officer in the Mossad, retired in his early 40s and he went out in the world and uh, did very well. And at the age of 65, he suddenly decided that he wanted to write a doctorate. So he abandoned all that he was doing and he spent 10 years on his doctorate. And his doctorate was about the um, relationship between the, the House of Saud, which is the house which uh, uh, ruled Saudi Arabia, and the Palestinian question. And he researched this for 10 years and he published the book. And unfortunately he died a couple of months after he published the book. I've been trying to get somebody to uh, uh, finance a translation, but it's not just a translation, it has to be rewritten of the book into English. I haven't succeeded up to now. It's one of my many failures. And um, he, amongst the things that he found was 
in the archives of the hospital, of the Hadassah Hospital. We have the Hadassah Hospital here in Jerusalem. It's one of the biggest hospitals in Israel. Originally, the first hospital was on Mount Scopus. I don't know if you've been to Mount Scopus or you've seen Mount Scopus, but Mount Scopus is the original site of the Hebrew University. This site, which you are here today, was actually constructed when, after the War of Independence, <clears throat> we didn't have access to Mount Scopus. And therefore, we built a, another campus. But after the Six-Day War, uh, we got the campus back, and the hospital has been uh, 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 revived. So the, the, there's a hospital on Mount Scopus, and a hospital, also the big hospital, which is uh, um, elsewhere, not far from here. In the archives in Mount Scopus, there is a letter written on the letter heading of the Royal House of Saudi Arabia. And the letter is written in English, and in it the writer thanks the um, staff in Mount Scopus, the doctors and the nurses, especially the nurses, by the way, for the wonderful treatment he and his brother received in Mount Scopus. And the words he used is really uh, taken out of the book of, uh, of the best prose you can think of. Any possible word of, uh, of uh, appreciation was in the letter. And the letter is signed Fahed. Fahed was the son of the founder of the dynasty of Ibn Saud. And he and his brother Mansur were sent by Ibn Saud to get medical treatment in a Jewish hospital in this country. And this at the time when King Ibn Saud was the most rabid anti-Semite in his public uh, dissertations, which he supported what Hitler did to the Jews in 90, in, during World War II. And he said that Jews are vermin, that he would like to clear the uh, entire area of Palestine from the vermin of the Jews. He said he would never allow a Jew to sit, to, 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 uh, to uh, uh, come to and, and set first foot on the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. This would contaminate the kingdom. And this king was the man who sent his sons. One of them became king later on in the 80s. And the other became the first minister of defense of Saudi Arabia. And you can imagine, therefore, that out of this, all kinds of things were woven over the years. And maybe one day it will be useful to talk about the role of medicine in intelligence. Believe me, it's not just keeping the intelligence officers healthy, which is important in itself. But it's many other things. And all these small little contacts came together to create a web of security for Israel over a long period of time. In order for Israel to be able to carry out this role, we had to be valuable. We not only had to project our capabilities, we had to be valuable, we had to be recognized as a force in the Middle East. We had to be recognized not only as one who, uh, as, a, as a force who um, uh, won the uh, War of Independence, but also as a force to be counted with whatever happens. And I can tell you a story, which has not been made public, about a war which went very badly for us, originally, initially, and that was the Yom Kippur War of 1973, when we were surprised on the holiest of our days on the Yom Kippur, that's why it's called the Yom Kippur War. And in the first week, the um, Egyptians in the, from the south and the Syrians in the north were able to penetrate Israel. The Syrians captured most of the Golan Heights and there was almost nothing to prevent them from simply racing to Haifa and getting to the shores. And the Egyptians were deep into the Sinai and a third of the Israeli Air Force had been destroyed, 80 aircraft out of 240. 
and a large contingent of the armored uh, capability of Israel, 800 tanks out of 2,400 been, uh, been uh, destroyed. And we were on the verge of a very, very, very difficult uh, situation that had to be countered. On the third day of the war, I was then station chief in Washington. I was called in for a meeting with a very senior official in the intelligence community. And he said to me, I have a list of questions for you. And the questions all related to the capabilities of Israel. What was left of the capabilities of Israel? What, is, what are you capable in the, in, in the, in the, uh, in the field of uh, air combat? What is your capability in, the, in armored combat and so on and so forth? And I said to him, look, uh, Tom, his name was Tom, Karamasinos. Look, Tom, this is not my business. I deal with intelligence about enemies. I don't, deal, I don't have information of my own. And I'm not sure there is information. He said, well, you know, you'd better get this information by the end of business today. Because if you don't get the information by the end of business today, we will no longer have any relationship with you. The relationship with Israel and the United States will be suspended. I said, why? He said, it's very simple. You've asked us for aid and help. We have to know whether we're aiding a winner. We're not going to aid a loser. Up to now, you've always been a winner. Now you're a loser. We have to know. Maybe in the end, uh, there might be some compassion. But basically speaking, the United States acts as a, as a, as a world power. We have strategic interests. And as he often said, you know, world powers don't have friends, they only have interests. I got the, um, the answer for him, together with a colleague of mine, the military attaché there, who subsequently, subsequently became chief of staff, General Gur. And oh no, the, after the United States was convinced that we had a fighting chance to turn the scales, did we get support? This has nothing to do with American Jewry, nothing to do with compassion, nothing to do with Western ideals, nothing to do with democracy, nothing to do with all these things which are dear to you and to me and everybody else. It's simply a question of interests. And by the way, when ultimately we began to win the war, there arose the possibility that Russia, the Soviet Union, would intervene in the war. And I will not go into all the details of what happened there, but ultimately, um, what happened was that we conditioned a certain step that we were asked to take. We had uh, surrounded a large section of the Egyptian army, the Third Army, on the eastern shores of the Suez Canal, and they were asking for food and water and we refused it. We said we will talk to them if they agreed to direct negotiations with us by military figures on both sides to determine how to end the war. And they agreed. And what became of that was that after this initial agreement and this initial meeting, within three years, we were in secret contact with the Egyptians and we were able to get the peace treaty. Now peace, ladies and gentlemen, is something which was achieved then and can be achieved ever in the future only when it's a win-win situation. The Yom Kippur War was a war in which there was not one victor and one defeated client. Both sides won the war. The Egyptians won the first week and we won the two second other weeks. If you go to Egypt today, you will see that Egypt has a massive military museum celebrating the victory of October 1973. The annual military parade of the Egyptian army takes place on the 6th of October every year to celebrate the victory in 1973. 
Because for the Egyptians, the war ended a week after it began. What happened after that didn't happen. It wasn't there. And from Israel's point of view, we don't have the same thing, but yes, we won the war. When both sides were able to win the war, we created the basis for peace and for common interests, which, by the way, have uh, overcome all the changes which have taken place since, nine, since we signed the peace treaty. There's been a change, there was the, the uh, uprising in, 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 in the, uh, the Arab Spring in, in Egypt, Mubarak was deposed, and the Muslim Brotherhood came in. And the Muslim Brotherhood is very anti-Jewish and anti-Israeli. But they kept the letter of the peace treaty on security affairs. And then when the Muslim Brotherhood went, and now we have General Sisi, we have a relationship with General Sisi. Not a very, very warm one, not a very public one. But yes, a significant one. Because we are a player. And we are a significant player. And we intend to continue to be a significant player. And at the same time, of course, we devote all our resources which we can to the civilian side of life, to science, technology, um, economics, the uh, um, annual income per capita in Israel now is $37,000 per capita. And we have 8 million population. As I said, we began at 600,000. Israel is no longer such a small country. We have more uh, citizens than Denmark. More than Norway, by the way. More than Ireland. Three countries which are respectable countries. And I'm not saying this in order to denigrate the Danes and so forth. We don't, uh, we don't, want, we don't feel uh, superior to them. We feel equal to them. But in this situation, ladies and gentlemen, we know that due to a variety of circumstances, we have three main problems we have to deal with on the security side. One is the issue of Iran and the Iranian nuclear threat. Two is international terrorism in all its manifestations. And the third is to maintain our position in this country and to maintain security for ourselves on, a, on a, uh, an ongoing basis. And that entails, of course, the Palestinian story. And I will say something about all three of these aspects and assets. I'll say something about Iran. You probably all, many of you know that we had a very good relationship with Iran before the uh, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini came into power. And because the Iranian people and us had common interests. They still have common interests, by the way. But um, the uh, revolution was a uh, revolution, uh, a religious revolution which is very, very dangerous when religion becomes part of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the body politic. And as of 1979, when Khomeini came into power, the relationship has changed. Iran today is on the precipice of a vast, almost uh, impossible crisis. The number of uh, Iranians has doubled and more in less than 30 years. There are 100 million Iranians today. And there's not enough food to go around. There's not enough water to go around. And Iran is on the precipice of a, of a staggering uh, crisis, the like of which is difficult to, to describe. But on the other hand, Iran has its own self-respect. 
And much of what Iran has done is because for over 100 to 200 years, I'd say, Iran was the, uh, one of the uh, um, hunting grounds of uh, foreign powers. The French and the, and the British and uh, later a bit the Americans. And uh, there was also a Russian inter interest in Iran. And there's a deep-seated feeling in Iran of, 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 of um, humiliation. I don't want to say uh, uh, more than that. And Iran wants its self-respect. I meet Iranians at all kinds of uh, meetings, which are sort of uh, track two meetings, they're called. I speak to them, I meet them, and so forth. And they talk to me, Iranians f coming from Tehran. And they say to me, I say to them, look, uh, you're now having uh, discussions with, uh, with the big powers, that's called the five plus one, the five major powers, and, uh, and Germany sitting all together negotiating with Iran on their nuclear pr uh, capabilities. Uh, you must feel proud sitting across the table, everybody sitting across the table. They said, you don't understand. It's a round table. I said, what do you mean round table? Don't you understand? He said, when there's a round table, everybody's equal. Everybody has the same position round the table. It's not we opposite them. And I think that a lot of what is happening today in Iran between us and the Iranians, between the West and the Iranians, so deals and has to do with this problem of self-perception. That's why I'm not sure you need physics in this, but certainly you need psychology. If there is a, a mix between physics and psychology, which you can put together and uh, use, I think it will be welcome. But the problem of Iran is that more than anything else. It wants to be a hegemon in the region. It wants to flex its muscles. And when it looks to Israel, suddenly it finds that Israel is also a hegemon in the region to a large extent. I don't think we're going to have a war with Iran. So I don't think we can think of a, 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 a rehash of what happened to us and the Egyptians. By the way, I don't relish another war with Iran. I think nobody relishes the war, a war with Iran. But I do believe that we will be able to cut the ice if we find the right formula of talking to them and them talking to us in a proper way. And that's why I believe that you should talk to your enemies all the time. A, because the enemy has to understand you, but you can better understand them by talking to them. And by the way, by the, when you talk to people, sometimes you have some influence over them. I think the Iranian uh, negotiations are continuing now. The pressures are mounting. I think the Iranians are going to make more concessions than anybody in this room can imagine. Maybe not enough. I hope they will be enough. They will have to make many more concessions. But it's also significant that on this particular issue, we have on the same side, the United States, Russia, China, Britain, France, and Germany, and Israel, all have the same interest. And we have always sought to find areas of identities of interests. And in that I think we've done very well. The second issue is the issue of terror. This is a much more complex issue and I will not be able to talk enough on this. But one of the phenomena which we have now in the region is the breakdown of the original uh, arrangements which were made a hundred years ago by the world powers after World War I. Now, as you probably have seen, there is a, an enormous outburst of, uh, of uh, literature on World War I. Books and books and books are coming out on World War I. And um, one, of the, uh, one of the outcomes of World War I was that this area, which was entirely under the Ottoman Empire, uh, was uh, cut in pieces, if you could call it that, and uh, all kinds of countries arose and regimes arose, 
mainly appointed by the colonial uh, powers at the time, mainly Britain and France with the United States a little at the side. Russia was not much involved then because Ru Russia was then much involved in its internal affairs after the changes in Russia in 1917. Although Russia has always been active here in a very, very significant way. And this order in the Middle East is now beginning to disintegrate. And the original countries and the original borders which were created after World War I are on the verge of disappearing. And in addition to the disappearance of the borders, we have two phenomena which are related to this. One is that more and more states in the region do not have the capability to exercise their sovereignty on the entire length and breadth of their countries. Egypt cannot impose itself on the Sinai. Syria, there is a civil war. Iraq is broken in three and the forces in the regime in, in, in Baghdad does not have control over the whole of the country and so on and so forth. And this is a phenomenon which is very dangerous to us because we want, need to have partners. And the question whether we have partners or we can have partners and talk to partners is a very difficult question. And the related result of this is a rise of what we call the non-state actors. They're not states, like the Hamas in Gaza, like the Hezbollah in Lebanon, like this uh, ISIS, which is now uh, controls an area which is bigger than France and Germany put together. And I could go on and on describing other areas in the Middle East where the central power no longer is able to uh, consummate its sovereignty in the areas. And I think that this is a challenge for us which we will have to face. It's a very difficult challenge. Um, the problem of terrorism, of fighting terrorism, is very difficult. It's very difficult to gather intelligence on terrorism. It's very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to uh, get a, a, uh, a viable and responsible uh, assessment as to who and what are terrorism. If you were to ask me today, tell me how many people are in this ISIS, ISIL, it has various names, these people who uh, behead people uh, on television and so forth. Is it 10,000? Is it 20,000? Is it 30,000? What do they have? What equipment do they have? What is their structure? It's very difficult to get information on this. We are getting it. We are working on it. Not only us. But this, of course, co creates interests. Interests which are vital to all the countries of the world because ISIS and all these Various uh, groups of terror are not only working here, they're also working in Russia, they're working in Central Europe, in Western Europe, in the United States and elsewhere. And suddenly there is a community of interest here. And we, because we are where we are here in this part of the world, we obviously have capabilities that many others don't have. So... On the one hand, as I said, there is this unfortunate situation in which you have all these players which you have to try and decide what to do with them. And they have to decide what to do with you. And also, of course, it also presents an issue of, uh, shall we say, of a moral issue. Do you do business with terrorists? Do you uh, talk to terrorists? Do you negotiate with terrorists? Because by negotiating with terrorists, you, to some extent, gave the, give them respectability. You acknowledge them as a, as a partner. And in this respect, uh, Israel has a policy on the one hand that it does not talk to these people. But in practical matters, it deals with them. <coughs> and we deal with them daily, with the Hamas in Gaza, although we say you have no right to exist. Just today, by chance, the uh, commander of the uh, division, the IDF division, the Israeli Defense Force division in Gaza, was quoted in a, in a conversation he had, which he didn't believe would be published, in which he said that one of the major interests he as the division commander has is that Hamas will continue to rule Gaza. 
It's very important for us because we have an address. So on the one hand, we don't recognize their right to exist and we pray for their disappearance. But on the other hand, we think it's vital that they should continue. And this is one of the contradictions of life here in the Middle East. That you have a policy which is in, by definition contradictory from within. The third thing we have here is the question of how we want to shape our future in this country. We've been here permanently for 2,000 years. There's never been ever, ever a situation in which there were no Jews living in Israel, in Palestine, or in this area, whatever you like to call it. There was never ever any moment in history where there were no Jews here. But the big comeback, of course, was the end of the 19th century. That's when it began. After World War I, we had 60,000 people here. After World War II, we had 600,000 people here. And now we have 8 million, including almost 2 million Arabs, who are Arab citizens, by the way. Fully-fledged citizens with representation in, in our parliament and doing extremely well economically now as well. And are up and coming also in the sciences and also in producing uh, very sophisticated equipment in high tech. But we have to see how we weld together somehow. And it's not easy because we came from all parts of the world and we have different views on society here. We have a big religious uh, element here. And religion plays a role in society. And the question is what, the, what should be the limit of such a role. And there is no agreement on this necessarily. So at the same time that we have these external problems, we have the internal problems which we are wrestling with all the time. But this is a vibrant society, as you see. And... Uh, I believe that in order to conclude, I would say that our strategy of reaching out all the time, of maintaining our capabilities and our value and our uh, credibility as a strong power in the Middle East, or as a former Prime Minister and a former Chief of Staff, Ehud Barak, said, to be the strongest military power within a radius of 1,500 kilometers, kilometers from Jerusalem, if we maintain that, we will be here for a very long time. And when I say a long time, I'd say we are going to be here indefinitely. And I believe that it's difficult, some, it has been difficult for many people in this region to accept this, but I think we are now past the point where people don't understand this, including the Hamas, for instance, who in discussions which have taken place with them say that ultimately they understand that they will not be able to overcome us. And I believe the same goes for the Iranians as well. They know that they cannot overcome us for a variety of reasons, which I would not like to detail too much here this evening, but I leave it to your imagination. If you have any questions, answers, or comments, or advice, <laughs> please. Okay, uh, let, let's start with the students, and then we go to the Israeli eternal. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do, does any of the students, if you like to ask a question, it's a rare opportunity. I don't know if you'll get an answer, but you can ask a question, please. I think we've been able to integrate demographically, demographically, as you call it, which is a very nice uh, term to use. Uh, uh, yeah. I like these scientific terms too. Uh, it's, it's, it's very reassuring. Um, we've been able to integrate de demographically most of the various uh, elements in society, both within the wider in security intelligence and, uh, and defense establishment, and also in the process of thinking 
and uh, working out uh, viable strategies. And I think that in this respect we have had a very big success. This is not to say that everything is agreed. This is not to say that everybody agrees on everything. But on the wide areas of what I've said this evening on what strategy should be, I think there is a wide consensus. And I think this is one of the sources of our strength. Sir. Um, <clears throat> when we started out um, in the early 50s and 60s, our relationship with the East was very, very minimal. We had a consulate in Bombay, we had a mission in Tokyo, and we had a, uh, an embassy in the Philippines. That's all we had. We tried to create a relationship with China, Beijing, China, and they rejected us. We tried to have a political relationship with India, and they rejected us. We tried to have a relationship with Indonesia, and we rejected it. They rejected us. But over the years, we were able to create clandestine relationships with India, with China, with Indonesia, and others. And when they, the situation changed on the international scene, when the Cold War came to an end, a series of countries, including China and India, established relations with us. And we were able to cultivate relations with both, by the way. And I think we cultivated them extremely well with India. Just a week ago, I met a senior uh, group of uh, former Indian uh, ministers who came here. And they met with me because all their requests to meet an Israeli political figure were turned down because the politicians are running for election now and they don't have time for visitors. So uh, I was called in as a reserve player. You know. <laughs> and there is a very... Trade has, has increased inc enormously between us and, Ch and, and, and India. But we understand that there are restraints and constraints. I don't have to tell you that uh, the Muslim population of India is bigger than the pa Muslim population of Pakistan. And this has, of course, an effect. <clears throat> I don't have to tell you that in China, despite all the considerations they have, they also have a Muslim minority over 50 million out of one and out, one something billion, but there are problems there from the Chinese point of view. But nevertheless, we have had in these relationships and we have also had a relationship of sorts in Indonesia. I visited Indonesia and I've been there more than once. <clears throat> and uh, when I was uh, where I was. But we have these relationships which are developing. We have two problems with relationship with the East, and that is that the relationship between the East and Iran in certain aspects is worrisome to us. When it came, for instance, to China, China was a country which in the 90s provided the Iranians with a separation plant in, uh, which they set up in Isfahan, which was vital for a military project in Iran. And all our requests and, and, and demands and so forth that the China refrained from doing this were turned down. I believe, by the way, that today China would not have done it, but that's too late. And China is very much involved in Iran. The Chinese are there in, in very, very big commercial oil uh, uh, prospecting, building oil fields, uh, tens of billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars already. So these are aspects which we have to take into, into, effect, into, in, into account. But there is a, the, the relationship in Israel and China has uh, budded, 
relationship with Israel in, in India has been uh, uh, always uh, a strong one as of 1991. Um, the new Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, is personally very well, uh, well, uh, well attuned with Israel and his relationship with the Israel is very good. The Prime Minister met him, I think, on occasion in, uh, in the United Nations. So I think that we're on the mend there. What is interesting is that the, the relationship with China and Iran is very strange because basically the Chinese <coughs> should not have wanted the Iranians the, with all the religious fervor to be in such close relationship. But there's one thing which unites them, that is that India and China as well for over 200 years was under influence of colonial powers in a very large way. And they find common language. Maybe India as well to some extent. But in India, the, the British uh, rule of India was different than the, the way the powers exploited uh, China and exploited Iran. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Iran and Syria <coughs> are linked today because uh, the Iranians have a, a military force inside Syria uh, fighting alongside uh, Bashar Assad. Before the civil war broke out in 2011 in Syria, Israel's dream was always to get a peace with Syria. Six consecutive Israeli prime ministers conducted negotiations with Syria. Six. One after the other. And each one reached the point where there was the issue of whether the Syrians would have access to the northern shores of the Sea of Galilee. The difference between Israel and Syria was the width of 50 meters. All the other issues had been resolved security and all the rest of it. I think, by the way, that the fact that we failed in this is probably our biggest strategic failure in all times. But today, with the civil war in Syria, I don't see any prospects of this because there is no uh, effective central rule in Syria. If the support which Iran gives to, to Bashar Assad, and by the way, Russia gives to Bashar Assad for different reasons. I, and we need to say something about that in a minute. Assad would, uh, would not be able to maintain even what he maintains today. His, he represents a, the Alawite minority, which is 3 million out of 23 million. This is a minority rule by any sense. So I don't think there is any chance of something serious between us and the Syrians within the in the future. The problem will be how to, from our point of view, how to uh, uh, maintain uh, security along our borders. We have borders with, Egypt, with Syria. We have an international agreement with Syria on the separation, line, what we call the separation line. And now, along most of the separation line, the forces of Assad are not there. But a, a motley of groups, including all the names which I mentioned, uh, including the worst of the worst, they are now on our borders. How to, uh, to manage this crisis, how to uh, involve, to, how to <clears throat> exercise what we call crisis management in such a situation is going to be a major challenge to, the, to any Israeli government. Iran is a different story. I believe that parallel to the, the negotiation which is going on between the 5 plus 1 and Iran, there is a battle royal in Iran inside the leadership. That's what they've told me. Some of them have told me. And I don't believe everything they say to me, but I believe some of what they say to me. Because in order for you to sound uh, logical in a relationship of the kind I'm talking about, you have to inject a large element of true things. Otherwise, it doesn't work. It don't, you don't have to be truthful 100%. But you have to be truthful 60%, 70%. 
And the question uh, is always how to, to separate the 60% from the 40% in, in relationships like these. And believe me, there, that's an art in itself. And you can make a mistake, a grievous mistake, if you get it wrong, the 60-40 on the other side. But I think in Iran there is a big uh, struggle now between uh, uh, rival forces in the leadership. And I believe that although the supreme leader hates the United States, he hates the United States and he hates Israel, he has no solution to the problems, the daily problems of his population. And he realizes that if he doesn't get an agreement, there is a serious, a serious uh, uh, danger that the regime in Iraq, Iran will sort of disintegrate. So we also have to watch what's going on in Tehran to the best of our capability and to seize the moment. Everything in this, era, this region, more than any other region in the world, is seizing the moment. Seeing the crack in the wall and get through it. We seceded many times, once or twice we didn't. That sounds like solving a physics problem. <laughs> Solidarity, you say? I didn't hear the word. About uh, solidarity and idealism. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> in the airplane on the way here, I spoke to a woman who worked in a kibbutz. She explained to me that actually many kibbutzes are having uh, a hard time. They're, many of them are bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And she explained that this is in fact the cause because there's less idealism and people are more individualistic. Um, second, How do you see this? Do you see this as a weakness or a potential threat in the future? And how do you see this developing in the near future? I think uh, <clears throat> there's a serious problem here. I think the problem of internal solidarity is serious. I think that the, is the issue between the relationship between the religious community who don't serve in the army and those who do is a serious problem. But I think there have been a lot of progress made here. The number of people from the religious community who are joining the army now is bigger than ever before. And there are units made solely out of religious people, more than one unit, more than two units, more than three units. I personally believe that this is the wrong strategy, but I think they should be somehow uh, dispersed amongst those. I don't believe it's, it's right to have a religious uh, brigade and a non-religious brigade and so forth. That is a, a recipe which could have serious uh, internal repercussions, uh, the like of which I don't want even to, to think of. But anyway, that's not what is the, the policy today, and I respect the policy the way it is. But the religious people are coming in. They understand that they must join the working force. They understand that they must ultimately allow women to go to work in, uh, in areas which they have not worked for before. They must let religious people go to uh, uh, for uh, uh, academic uh, studies. In here, in this university, Hebrew University today, the number of religious people is growing all the time. Some of them want to have special classes for religious people. And sometimes these requests are, are, are granted. I believe mistakenly, but as I said, this is being, there is, there is a big change inside the religious community today. And when it comes to the kibbutzim, the kibbutzim were never more than 3-4% of the country, but they were the elite. There were times when 60% of Israel's air pilots came from the kibbutzim. 70% of the commanding, commanding uh, commanders in the, in the land forces came from the kibbutzim. The kibbutzim were, to a large extent, elite in the country. They were the, the ultimate, uh, how should I say, uh, uh, heroes in this country. This has changed. And the kibbutzim have gone through a difficult time. The kibbutz uh, system of life has also gone, undergone a, 
uh, a big change. Most of the kibbutzim have been privatized now. The other kibbutzim who still have communal life together is very few. They've taken a different route. And the, over the years, these crises have had an effect on the people in the kibbutzim. And they've also undergone the serious economic problems. And they, uh, when we had a big economic crisis in the 80s, some of the kibbutzim went bankrupt. So yes, there have been many problems. But I think in the end, somehow, um, we put it together. That's part of the, I don't want to say the Israeli miracles, but uh, and I, don't, I don't want to suggest to you there are miracles in life. Although I will suggest to you that sometimes things are done which are beyond uh, uh, human uh, understanding. And some of the things which we have been doing, which I might have been able to tell you more if uh, Eliezer would have allowed me to talk more, but I am I'm the major obstacle between you and dinner, and that's a very tough call to make. First of all, let me tell you, I never bet. <laughs> <laughs> betting is very popular in this country. We have, you know, uh, we have a, a lot of uh, betting uh, going on. Uh, uh, the national lottery we have, we have betting for uh, football games and so on. That's a very big business here, betting. And I'm, in the past, I used to buy a, uh, a bet every week for the national lottery. I never made any money. And I've lost, uh, lost all my... Uh, um, how should I put it, my uh, confidence in, in the lottery. Yeah. I think it's a, uh, there must be a big, uh, um, how should I say, uh, something there which I didn't uh, grasp. <laughs> <laughs> now on the question which you really asked. It's a long story, as you will understand. And since you're Israeli, you understand it just as I do. The basic problem, in my view, is that the, the Palestinian Authority has not yet proven to itself that it has the capacity to rule a country. When I meet Palestinians, I meet them in all kinds of uh, uh, meetings with them, I say to them, why are you crying and whining and, 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 and weeping about how bad your situation is? We, we didn't whine. We were 600,000 people here. We got up one day and we declared independence. Declare independence. Why do you need to... Why are you afraid? No, but declare independence and, 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 and get, your, get, your, get, your, get your house in order. And this they have not done. Look, we declared uh, independence. We didn't get any international support. We didn't get one dollar from the government of the United States. The only time we got aid from the United States was after 1967. The Jews of the United, of, of, of the United States helped us, but there was no country in the world, there was no international conference to help the Jewish people after the Holocaust, by the way, in which we lost a third of our people, and this is something which is unique, and I don't want to go into this, but I mentioned it because of this. Nobody got up and said, oh, now the Jews need have their state, international community must help uh, the, the remnants of the Holocaust. Nobody did it. But the Palestinians, they have every year they have a conference, a donors conference. All the time they're donors conference. The Americans are donors. 45 states meet in Cairo every time for the donors conference. But why should they have a donors conference? Some of the biggest shipping magnates in the world are Palestinians. They don't contribute one shekel for the cause of the Palestinians. So when it comes to the question of should we do more? Yes, we should do more. Should we be more helpful? Yes. The question is not, unfortunately, in my view, whether the two-state solution is viable from us. The question is, are they a viable, not a viable partner in terms of the negotiation, 
Are they able to conduct their affairs? When Arafat came to power, he was a dismal failure. Arafat didn't make the transfer from the head of a, a national movement into a leader of a country. Ben Gurion did. Because we built the state all the time. We built the state for 40, 30, 40 years. We had our medical system, we had our education system, we had our economic system. They did nothing. Nothing at all. And they want the world to help them all the time and, to, and, to, and to, to invest in them all the time and so forth. My father always used to say when I used to help, ask for help, he said, God helps those who help themselves. Let them help themselves. <laughs> okay, I think we... Is it urgent? Because you asked already, both of you asked. I think uh, maybe we'll truncate you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Don't forget the, um, the gold uh, spikes on the railings. <laughs>